Last week I met with Rob Nezard, who's the Managing Director of UKRadiators.com. I also forgot to record this introduction, which is why I'm doing it now. Rob's made a pretty interesting discovery, which is that radiator outputs aren't always what they seem. So in our conversation, which is quite long, we cover that uh, as well as some of the detailed technical aspects of radiator sizing and obviously how it can overall impact your heating system's performance. So let's go. Hello, Rob. Ethan, how you doing? Good to see you, mate. Thanks for coming on. You too. Um, so I'll I'll save everybody um, save everybody the, the headache of listeners to, to ramble on with pre- pleasantries because they, they normally want to get straight into it. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously on LinkedIn, I've seen you're you're kind of fighting a good fight with regards to to, to radiator output. So um, can you just give us a bit of bit of background on that? Yeah, absolutely, mate. Um, do you say where where do you say it's in LinkedIn? Primarily, it's the YouTube video that um, that that kind of started it all off. So we've got a video on YouTube that we made at the beginning of the year, or we pu- we published at the beginning of the year, tail end of last year. We made it um, where we 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 made it like, like a mini documentary, um, about seven minutes long, that shows how. Um, tons of distributors and retailers are overstating their heat outputs of the radiators that they sell um so i've been in the industry a long time like i've known it's been happening for a long time it's um you know the the, the various bodies in the industry um, know that it's happening um it, because it's kind of obvious when you when you when you know what you're looking for from the consumer perspective it's really hard to tell but from you know, when you're in the industry, you know, you look at a radiator, you, you've tested all of your radiators, you know what heat output a radiator is going to be able to have based on certain properties. Um, and then if you've got other players in the market that are selling similar products, but with just mysteriously much higher heat outputs than, than, than what a, a radiator can produce based on test results, it, it's glaringly obvious that it's not real you know it's overstated um so we kind of got to a point where we just thought yeah at, somebody needs to do more than what's being done i'm not going to say no one's ever done anything because people have tried um to to kind of get something done about this but you know at the, at the at the point that we got to last year we just looked at it and thought content's the way forward right the way to raise awareness around this is just is make some content and put it out there and see if we can build some traction with it so that's what we did how, how did you sort of find out i mean how what, what what sort of led you to unearth it yeah so like like i said it's like it's obvious when you know what you're looking at so if i look at a um, you know a 600 by 600 free column radiator i i know that that is roughly um 700 to 750 ish watts at delta t50 um maybe a little bit more maybe a little bit less but it's got to be in that ballpark right if i if but so if i go on a website and i see one that's a thousand watts it's like why how how is that physically possible it's got it's the same size it's the same material it's got the same amount of water in it how is it 300 watts or even 250 to 300 watts higher. It's just not possible, right? So yeah, some, somehow they're breaking the laws of physics. And are they are they listing them at different flow temps, or are they, um, or are they basically just is it the same flow temp, the same size, the same water volume, but mysteriously higher heat output? Yeah. So you you get um, you get people that that kind of try to to play the the sort of delta T70 game, right? Where they they kind of they list it at delta T65 or delta T70, and they don't put the delta T next to it. So they'll just have, you know, right. like 7,000 BTUs, something like that, because that's what they know yeah. consumers are looking for. It, not even up to, yeah. they just put it, just 7,000 BTUs. Like, it doesn't say 7,000 BTUs, <laughs> yeah. delta T70, it's just 7,000 BTUs. It's like, what does that even mean? Like, to me and you, we know that that doesn't mean anything, right? Because at what temperature is it 7,000 BTUs? But to the consumer, they don't yeah, know. Yeah. Like, they just see the big number and think, oh, that's a powerful one. Great, you know? Um, so you've got those people that are doing that, and then you've got ones that are listing at delta T50, um, which is the requirement 
um, on the BSE and 442, Delta T50 and Delta T30, everything should be listed at. Um, but their Delta yeah. T50 um, output is overstated. So you'll have where, like I say, a comparable radiator. The one that we used in the in the documentary was a 600 by 600 column rad, three columns, um, and you know we took five from five different retailers and tested them all at, at Bisria, and they all came out within the, the uh, you know, within around kind of 700 watts at Delta T50. But some of these retailers yeah. are listening them up to 1,000 watts. Um, but like I say, the, the thing that unearthed it, or the thing that kind of unearthed it for us is just through doing testing ourselves and through going through um, what is necessary to sell uh, compliant radiators in the UK, you just, you you learn, right? You learn what, what's possible, um, you learn what isn't possible. <laughs> and then when you see what isn't possible, it kind of just jumps off the page at you because you know what you're looking at. Obviously, from a consumer's perspective, it's a little bit different, which is why we've decided to to kind of go this route to show what it is that we know and just to kind of shed some light on that from the consumer's perspective. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And and is it? Um, I mean, obviously, on like the bog standard white panel rads, the the, the kind of Stellrad, Meissen, you know, your typical as you'd expect to see in B and Q kind of radiators. As from from what I can tell, they're all they're all sort of much of a muchness, right? I mean, amongst the big manufacturers, they're all pretty much identical. Mm -hmm. um, or am I wrong on that? Is it mainly the designer rads where things get a bit? So dodgy. So your big manufacturers like Stellrad and and whatnot, right? With, with panel rads, yeah, like they're members of Mark. Um, like to be a member of Mark, which is the Manufacturers Association for Radiators and Vectors, we are also a member of Mark. To be a member, you you know you've got to be legit. Um, but there are tons of radiators on the market supplied by manufacturers that that are not members and um, are not legit, and it includes panel rads. Like I'm not, I'm not going to name names um like we didn't name names in a doc documentary and i'm not going to name names now just because of course it's it's just one of the you know it's a sensitive topic right and um we're only a small business we're a small family run business right and um i i'll, I'll be completely honest with you i promised my mum because my mum's a shareholder in the company that when i do this i'm not going to go out there and get us drawn into some massive legal battles right because she don't need the sleepless nights um i'd be honest <laughs> personally but you know when you've got you've got other people involved other stakeholders and things like that you've got to take everyone into consideration right so what should do yeah yeah but but there are panel rads out there that are overstated there's there's one um distributor brand let's say in particular that um i know are overstated not because we've done testing but because i've seen their test reports Right. So I've seen test reports from a brand that sells panel rads that lists its panel rads with higher heat outputs than are in its own test reports. Right. I've seen this from factories as well. So we were going to launch our own range of panel rads. Right. So we were working with we talking to factories in, in Turkey, primarily looking at launching our own range of panel rads. Um, and we got quite far in some in some conversations with um, with one particular factory. Um, to the point that we were actually doing testing, um, doing testing ourselves, um, even though they had test reports, they were European test reports and, you know, post-Brexit, UKCA and all of that. At that point, we needed to do our own testing. But long story short, they had a catalogue where they had heat outputs advertised in their in their catalogue. And when we finally got their test reports out of them, they were overstating um, the heat outputs in their catalogues versus their own test reports. So this is a problem that happens like throughout the supply chain at various levels throughout the supply chain. And yeah, it's, uh, it's panel rads as well as designer rads. Um, there are reputable brands out there, of course. Um, you know, we're a reputable brand. There are reputable, other reputable brands. I'm not saying we're the only one, um, but yeah. you know what you're looking for, right? And you've got to, you've got to be aware of that. Yeah, yeah, you're right, and that's that, that's what interested me so much when I kind of when it kind of cropped up, and then I watched um, the documentary, and I was like, you wouldn't even think about that because you would just you would just expect that you know the technical data is the technical data, and that's it. It can't be overstated or understated. It is that, but mm -hmm. but but ultimately, as as we know, I mean, we've we've been through all the Bizria uh, testing with the thermoskirt, and we also put it through the TUV in Germany, and we put it through the TSE in Turkey. 
and they had different results. Mm -hmm. Even the three test chambers had different results because then you find out that like um, the, the TSE in Turkey, they tested the thermoskirt against a wall like it would be installed. But the Bizria has to taste has to test the thermoskirt like a radiator. So to do that, they hang the radiator in an open space. Yeah. And they, then they hung a, a four meter section of thermoskirt in an open space. But that is going to change the performance. You know, really it should be installed how it would be installed. If it's going to be next yeah. to a window or it's going to be um, you know, on the floor or and if it's under full heating, it should be under a carpet. You know, like with underfloor heating, they have a we we see it all the time with underfloor heating. It says up to 100 watts a square meter. Right. You think well with what with with tiles mm -hmm. in concrete running mm -hmm. at 50 degrees, not running at 40. You know, under a carpet. Mm -hmm. So, um, for us, there's always consumers don't want that. Consumers just want a straight answer. Yeah, they want clarity. Clarity. It's like, it's correct. It's like how many calories is in this Mars bar? Yeah. yeah, the, the yeah. problem is, is that the, si the size of the Mars bar keeps changing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Just out of yeah. interest, if you're, so the testing that you did, um, so you said, like, so you had done testing in Germany and testing in the UK, what came out higher? Yeah. Um, the Germans came out the lowest. I mean, you, you're talking within 10%. So it's one of those that, like, by output margins per meter, it's, it's absolutely minimal. So we, we might be, so in the, in the UK, Delta T50, um, the R2 pipe profile is coming out at 120 watts, uh, a linear meter, a Delta T50. In Germany, it was coming out at like 118, but then in uh, Turkey, it was coming out at 134. So it's right. kind of like 12, 11% higher in Turkey. Yeah. Um, yeah. But for us, we use, the, we, we use the Bizria data because we're selling mainly in the UK. Yeah. Um, and when we sell it to Europe, we ask them, do you want the UK figures or the German figures? But you're talking about a couple of watts per meter difference. It's, it's neither here nor, nor there. Mm. And obviously, as you go down to lower flow temperatures, that, dis, that, dis, that difference is, is even narrower. Yeah. Because you know a 10 percent the... difference. Sorry? No, I was going to say, like, it is really good. Like, it's really interesting to know that because um, – the stuff that I'm talking about is is a bit different to that because, like, some of these factories, they're overstating against their own test reports, their own European test reports. But I have long yeah. suspected that um, different testing done in different um, locations produces different results, um, which they shouldn't because they're they're supposed to be calibrated to the point that they they um, the, the test chamber um, is um, this produce would produce the same results against like their master radiators which they have and they send these master rads around um but i guess for you obviously where the product's different if it's installed differently then there's going to be a, a bigger potential well there definitely is going to be a, a bigger margin isn't there if they're, if they're installing it differently with radiators you would expect that that wouldn't be the case um but there's just something there that kind of makes me suspect a little bit that um even with radiators testing that's done in, in different locations is actually producing different results but yeah not to the same degree as what yeah. we're talking about with these overstated outputs and the biggest issue um isn't the, the stuff that we're working on and working to to kind of um raise awareness of isn't really um you know a, a margin of five or ten percent within yeah. testing. it's like somebody going i don't really care about testing i'm just going to sell it and say it's a thousand watts because i can because no one's going to stop me do you know what i mean yeah yeah it's it's just basically um miss selling in in a, in a way yeah you know and it might not be from a manufacturer like you say it might just be from a distributor and it, it, the difficulty is is that you know you could you know your 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 business is well established long established reputable you know a member a member of the of the relevant trade bodies um yet you know i could go on squarespace right now and set up UK radiators direct.net with no employees <laughs> and just say whatever I want, you know. And you if could. I get sued, I just shut the website down. You could, but um, the, 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 the radiators that we tested, so the, the radiators that we purchased and the places that we purchased them from are, are businesses that have been in the industry longer than we have. Like one yeah. of them. One of them, this is as much as I'll say about them, is a publicly traded um, 
a, a, a publicly traded like multi-channel bathroom retailer. Um, that's as much as I'll say. I'll say about right. that. But, but they're yeah, massive. Yeah. massive. Yeah, we, we can guess. Yeah. You can guess. Yeah, yeah. I, suppose, I suppose. I suppose for. Uh, I suppose for like bathroom retailers as well. It's a bit of a weird one because a radiator is just something that's part of what they part of what they sell. So not necessarily heating specialists, but it's like a you know a towel rail is is like an accessory to the bathroom and not necessarily being seen as something that has to perform a, a, a technical job. You know, it has to. But they're selling radiators. It's selling, selling like you know, the massive masses of radiators, like vast numbers of radiators, not just towel rails. You know, they have entire heating sections. Um, some of them, some of the, some of the, you know, test samples that we did were specialist like radiator um, retailers, and as I say, like a couple of them were much wider um, in in terms of the product offering. Um, but they are selling the radiators that we're testing, and they are selling radiators. So um, they need to. They need mm. to sell compliant products, right? Whether it whether it's a radiator, a towel rail, or a tap, or whatever it is. There's, I mean, I don't know the regulations around taps, so I don't need to. But I'm sure there are some, um, and they need to be. They need to be, <laughs> don't they? Otherwise, what what is a consumer supposed to do? How are they supposed to know? Yeah, yeah. There's there's enough there's enough um, regulatory reports to read in the heating industry before we get onto taps. I have not got that much time. <laughs> get onto <laughs> taps. There's, there's better there's better reading to be had and 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 did you do did you do any uh, did you do any looking into who the liability lies with so if an installer buys a radiator that's got an overstated output and they install it and it underperforms how how is that then pursued by the customer if if they're underheated so if the installer buys it and supplies it to the customer you mean i mean the customer I, I guess it goes straight back to the installer I think the, the the difficulty with this stuff is right um, is that whatever happens, like whoever the liability lies with the customer, the end user is going to go back to the installer first of all, even if they've bought the radiator, right? This is why you've got. So I've got mates that are plumbers and heating engineers, right? One one of my best mates, he he hates designer radiators, right? He hates vertical, like anything that's not a standard panel rad. He can't stand it because it just always caught. It, he's had bad experience with bad experiences with them where it's caused him problems um yeah and because what happens is whatever goes wrong anything if, if, if anything goes wrong with an install if it's not performing as the customer expects the first port of call is always going to be the installer right um and even just getting that phone call having to deal with that um issue when you haven't especially when you haven't done anything wrong it's taking time out of your day right it's you know and these are busy people yeah. that need to keep working they're self-employed people you know that, uh, that, yeah. that, that that need to be on to the next job right so yeah whether whether they've supplied it or whether the customer has gone and bought it themselves um the installer is always going to be the first port of call which is not good for them um and with regards to who is ultimately liable or, or where the installer should go or where the installer should direct their customer if they're if, if they are certain that it is you know they've done their job and they've installed the product correctly and there's no issues around that and there's potential that actually the reason that room isn't yeah. getting was because the the heat output was overstated um then it's about it, you have to go back to the place that you bought it from but liability sits with the brand owner, right? So under construction product regulations, which is what BSE M442 sits below, the anybody that places a product onto the UK market under their own brand name assumes all responsibility of the manufacturer. So whether you physically make that product or not, if it's your brand, it's your responsibility. Wow, okay. Right. So even if you branded an imported product, it's on you. Absolutely, yeah. I suppose that's the way that it should be, isn't it? And the the, the other the other thing, of course, and this is this is uh, I've got another call lined up with a guy called Nathan Gamblin. I don't know if you know Nathan, um, but um, he, you know, you know Nathan, yeah. Um, yeah I did his talk podcast. Yeah, yeah, I did his podcast a little while. You did a call together, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, no, we did it. We did his um, uh, beta talk podcast. Um, so I had a, had a chat with him for about an hour on there. Yeah, no, I really like it. Oh, well, I'll be having that exact same conversation with him next week, probably. Yeah. 
But um, yeah, the, the, with with Nathan, one of the things I was talking about was that um, so so we list our outputs because we only have on the wet system we only have two profiles. So as you know, with a radiator range, when you when you ask a radiator manufacturer to to provide you with their range of radiators, it's like a booklet that's like fifty pages. And every single page has got a chart on it, and you've got all of the heights down one side, and all of the length, mm. you know, sub sub, sub rows within the rows, and then all of the various you know things like weights, measurements, and everything, BTUs and what. So it just becomes this massive you know thing to look at. And so they obviously just list their outputs at delta T fifty, mm. because if they listed at every flow temperature, the book would be like war and peace. So they give you all of the outputs of delta T50, and then they give you their correction factor table. Now, because we only have two profiles, we just have the two pipe and the three pipe, we, we just publish all our outputs. So we, we just have a chart, and it just goes, you know, this is the two pipe, this is the three pipe, and as you increase the flow temperature, you know, that just increases the output per meter. Um, and obviously, because it's a per meter rate, per meter output, it doesn't really matter. As you increase the number of meters in a room, you get more output. So you might just do two walls and hit the heat loads, or you might need to do three walls and hit the heat loads, or you might need to do four walls. Um, or in some of the new builds, or if, or if we do passive house, we literally just do one piece of thermoskirt. You know, what one piece of thermoskirt in a bedroom on a heat pump, um, the two pipe system, it's about 60 watts a meter. So that'll do about 120 watts, which in passive house is just plenty so we just size it like that but all of the boiler manufacturers and this is where there's total you know mis misalignment is that all the radiator outputs are at delta t50 and all the boiler efficiency outputs are at delta t30 because they want your boiler to run at 50 degrees or below or ideally 60 degrees below when they list an energy rating it's in condensing mode mm -hmm. you know it's like it's like your it's like your volkswagen golf you know it does Yes, it does 60 miles per gallon when you're on a motorway doing 48 miles an hour behind a lorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you on that. Um, uh, BSEM442 actually requires you to list um, Delta T50 and Delta T30. Um, that is a requirement under BSEM442. So if you see a radiator supplier not w w in their catalogue, whether it's on a website, electronic, like a physical catalogue, if they're not listing at least Delta T50 and Delta T30, that in, in and of itself is non-compliant right so that is a requirement it's also a requirement for the ce label or the uk ca label that goes onto the product and on the declaration of performance to include delta t50 and delta t30 so that is a requirement so anyone that's not doing that should be doing that um as well as that um we like we list delta t50 delta t40 and delta t30 on our website just to make that comparison easier obviously with it being a um a website and it being radiators and there being so many products and so many different um product attributes that we need to list as well um we haven't gone any further than that at this point i, I do like what you guys do though i think that it, it's it's really helpful um for the consumer to understand that a product can output uh, uh, an emitter let's say can output um different outputs at different temperatures and just showing it like on a table or on a graph um kind of makes gives gives that visual representation which makes it kind of easier to understand um because uh, what we get a lot of the time with, with our customers is, is that kind of difficulty in understanding of like you know what is delta t this delta t that like what are you talking about do you know what i mean because it's just it's just so much information like they get to the point of understanding of btus right they're like right btus i've got it i understand now i need btu because at the beginning of their journey sometimes they don't even know that they just think a radiator is a radiator and that's it yeah. Right. And so yeah. going along that journey and, and discovering that actually, okay, well, I need to understand heat output. I need to understand BTUs. I need to understand what. So I then need to understand, you know, and they get to a point and it's like a, a lot of information. Um, so I can say, yeah, what you guys do, I do, I, I do really like that. I think that's uh, a smart way of going yeah. about it. It's, it, I mean, it's easy for us to do because, because like I say, we've just got the two, the two profiles. And um, so I do, you know, I do get it. One of the things that we, one of the challenges we have, and particularly now that people are designing to lower flow temperatures, is that the customer gets given like a radiator schedule. So often when they get like their first heat pump survey done, the engineer comes out, they do like a whole house heat loss, and then they basically give them the radiator sizes. But normally on that on that chart, they have the radiator sizes. So it may say, for example, like we had one yesterday, which was bedroom one, um, Cellrad K2, um 
was it yeah 600 by 1200 so it's a two kilowatt radiator that is you know 2.1 kilowatt radiator um, so the customer comes to us and they're obviously looking for an alternative because they don't want the, the K2 radiators. Um, and they said, we need 2.1 kilowatts of thermoscope. Right, right. So, so that, you know, then our design team's like, no, 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 2.1 kilowatts in this bedroom, it, you know, that's like 190 watts a square meter mm. <laughs> that we're putting into this. It was only mm. built like in 2005. So, mm. But they get they, they get given a, a radiator schedule that's not even at the design temperature of their heating system that you know that it's been designed to. Obviously, the the engineer is going, um, you know, it's a two kilowatt radiator with a correction factor of 0 0.3. It's a 700 watt radiator, in mm. actual fact. But the customer's seen it as 2.1 kilowatts. Mm. And and I know that underfloor heating companies have that same issue that we do because underfloor heating companies do their designs at 40 degrees. So they give their output to 40 degrees to say this underfloor heating system is going to produce, you know, one kilowatt in this room. The, the heat loss of that room was was 550 watts. Mm. So so the customer was looking at a radiator that was that was on, on paper four times too big. And, we, yeah. you know, we would never we would never marry that up. And yeah, um, yeah. so one of the things that we're, we're really trying to push uh, homeowners to do as well is um, is a whole house heat loss properly doing it properly i mean th this year in germany they introduced a, a, a new law where if you're installing a new boiler even if it's gas not just a heat pump but any new central heating system you have to do a heat loss survey which in the uk you don't you don't have to do um so if you go into a house that's got like my, my house for example when when i moved when i moved into it the, the heat load on my house is about eight kilowatts that's the heat load um i've got a 35 kilowatt gas boiler but obviously that's for the hot water and there's about when i've totted up all of the thermoskirt that's in there and i do have a radiator in the hallway so you know so right. kill me now yeah <laughs> kill me now have have got towel rails in the bathrooms and i have got a radiator in the hallway um but when i've totted up the you know the total heat output on my house at 50 degrees on the boiler so uh, well 50 degree mean temperature uh, so delta t30 my, my heat output is about 8.8 kilowatts so i'm about 10 percent over what the heat loss of the house is is showing um, and that's at minus that's at minus three and a half where was i going with that oh yeah and um, when i moved in i had about 25 kilowatts worth of radiators in there right because some of them were put in, in the 1970s when the house had single glazing there was no loft insulation you know there, there's a there was a gas fire in there that had an open flue that's now closed off so the houses, the house heat losses have massively reduced, and we also have this problem of people massively oversizing radiators. You know, engineers go in and say, "Well, they've got a a 1.5 meter K1. I'll just put another one of those in because the pipes are in the right place." Mm. When in actual fact, that that single panel VAD was put in in the 70s, and it doesn't need anywhere near as much mm. heat um, as that. And obviously, that then, then impacts the boiler performance. So there's, there is a bit of a, an education piece to do, not just around the fact that, sorry. No, I was going to say, sorry to, to, to jump in, but an, o, an oversized radiator isn't going to negatively impact boiler performance, though, is it? No, no, sorry, you're right. Maybe I should probably rephrase that. Um, if, they want, if they want to run their heating system constantly in condensing mode, they should be sizing the, the heating system appropriately and then putting the appropriate size radiators in. So, you know, yeah, they, they, they might... It's an oversize. It enabled you to you you can run your system yeah. at those lower temperatures. Undersized radiators are really where 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 the challenge would come in. But I do I totally get what you're saying, and I think for you, especially from your perspective as well, like where you've got people that are comparing and and they think that they need what you know their understanding of what they need versus what they have can create confusion, especially if they're looking at alternative options for sure. That's where you've got to have a good heating engineer, though, right? That that, that can um, that can do the calculations for the customer like properly. Um, that's why heating engineers, I don't know, they're so important, right, for this for this space. Like sometimes we, you know, we get customers that, um, you know, they're like they they're using um, people to upgrade and update their 
heating system effectively but the people are not heating engineers so they're they're looking at it purely yeah. from like swapping a radiator or just from the radiator perspective but they're not considering that in line with the rest of the heating system that 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 can happen a, a you know a fair amount and we do always say to to our customers that if you are like making significant changes to your heating system really you need a heating engineer that can that can do those heat loss calcs for you right yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and to be with you, even even when we get some calculations through from heat and heating engineers, they've overspecced because there's always this concern that um, the customer is not going to run it right. You know, if, if they do a heat, if they install a heat pump, and the customer wants to operate that heat pump like a boiler, you know, so they've got a, a central thermostat that they're whacking on and off all day, then you know the engineers build in like a safety factor then on the radiators or on the thermoskirt because because they don't want a complaint. They don't want the customer to call them up and, in the middle of January and say, yeah, my room's not reaching temperature and it's been on for two hours. When mm -hmm. in reality, you know, when it's minus three outside, that radiator might take four hours to heat that room up. You're just not giving it enough mm -hmm. time. You know, really, you should never you should never turn your heating system off if it's designed correctly. Right. You should just run it. Yeah, for um, a heating system, right? The, yeah, the, the analogy we use, the analogy we use for um, domestic customers to explain that is that it, that I mean, it's the usual one, it's a fridge in reverse, but we kind of say like your house is like a fridge inside out. So a fridge, it's warm on the outside, cold on the on the inside, and, and it's effectively treating your house like an inverse fridge, it's cold on the outside and warm in the middle. Well, the difference is it's like with your actual fridge, if you if you fill it with warm beers, it makes everything else in the fridge warmer. Mm. You know, the, the, the temperature of that fridge climbs and then drops back down again. If you have your fridge set to five degrees and you fill it with warm liquid, you know, the temperature of your fridge goes up to 10 and then back down to five. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens when you open windows and open doors. Yeah. And, and likewise, you know, if your fridge, if you're, um, if, if you're turning your fridge on and off all day, the compressor is going to break. Yeah, no, that's a really, that is a really good analogy because no one's turning their fridge off, are they? Correct. You, you don't you don't leave work and then call home and say, yeah. right, it's Friday night. You know, I, I want a beer. Turn the fridge on, love, fridge because on. <laughs> it's on. You know, it's cold. It's ready for you. So, you, you know, you've got weather compensation on the heat pump. As the outside temperature drops, the, the heat pump compensates for that. And it just does this slowly, slowly, seasonally. And, mm. um, you know, you should yeah. rarely get caught out. It's a, it's a major challenge. And in a, few, in a few weeks, it might actually be next week, the, 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 report, the report data from Energy House 2 is coming out. And that's really interesting because they've got the houses in a, a set climate chamber, which is set at minus five. They're testing underfloor heating, they've tested, under, they've tested radiators, they've tested the thermoskirt. And in that test, I mean, I'm not revealing, not revealing too much on this, because this, this is probably, probably going to go out after the report's been published. But um, when, when you turn a heat pump on and off, like you would with a boiler, whether it's underfloor or radiators or thermoskirt, the, the performance is atrocious. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. you know, if, if someone was going to run it like that, I would say, just keep your gas boiler. Mm. because yeah. you know, unless you're going to use it correctly you, you, you're not going to save any money whatsoever mm -hmm. <laughs> it's going to cost you more yeah you might as well save yourself 10 grand and go on holiday yeah, yeah sure yeah i mean even like even with gas boilers really people should be using weather compensation right um but like, yeah with it, but it's just like, i mean even that like as a topic it's like something that i don't know like no one seems to have ever heard of it Right, like the, in the general, obviously, in the industry, of course, they have. But I mean, in the kind of general public, like you mentioned the term, like weather weather compensation. People are like what? Like what are you talking about? Whereas that should be the norm for for, for gas boilers, all of these A-rated boilers that, like you said, are efficient when they're operating in condensing mode. There's like efficiencies to be gained there just with weather compensation, and people just uh, are completely unaware of it, right? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you, you don't even need to understand what weather compensation is to, to basically add weather compensation onto your system. I mean, when I, we added weather compensation onto our boiler, the, the kit from Screwfix cost forty quid. Yeah. Okay, you needed a bit of cable to go with it. It went outside of the house in in the shade as long as it's not in any direct sunlight or or direct wind, and the cable basically comes into the PCB on the boiler and plugs into two little weather comp connectors. Yeah. That's it. You don't need to know how it works. It just does. Yeah. <laughs> You well, don't know yeah. how your Nespresso machine works, do you? You just put a pod in. But they need to know it exists. <laughs> yeah, like, correct. Yeah, you need to know it exists. Or how it works or anything. You just need to know this exists and it improves your system, you know, and saves you money. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly that. Exactly. When, and um, and when, one of the... 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> so go on, Rob. Sorry, back move on. When you installed that on your system, I'm going to start asking you questions now. When you installed that on your system, yeah. um, did, did you do any kind of uh, like uh, like before and after um, like calculations or like because because I've been interested in doing that with uh, with um, with weather compensation like on a, just on a gas central heating system just to to, to to actually like in a real life see what the difference is in terms of consumption. Um. Yes, I did. In fact, there was a fair bit of experimentation and, it, and actually it probably took me about two winters before I got it right because the first winter I just sort of left it. I had the house set up exactly as it was. We added the weather compensation. On my, I've got a manifold, so all of the thermoscopes plumb back to a manifold so I can see what the flow and return temperatures are on the manifold. Mm -hmm. So I could see really in the winter, you know, the boiler was still running at, I, I sized it all to run at 55 degrees or less. So the flow temperature was set at 55 degrees. When I added the weather comp, the, flow, the maximum flow temperature went up, weirdly. Right. Okay. until I kind of over, over overrode it and moved it back down. So what I was told to do was when you had the weather compensation, just turn the flow temperature on the boiler up and then let the weather compensation do its do its job. Yeah. And what, what, what happened was is that when the weather compensation did do its job, it didn't actually reduce the maximum flow temperature down. The maximum flow temperature was higher. Right, right. Okay. So I, I, I did see a difference, but it was it was it was like seven or eight percent. Mm hmm. Um, which is not it's not insignificant but on, on like a, on like a, a gas bill that's say 100 quid a month you know it's like it's like seven quid a month mm. it was not you know it wasn't like oh what a revelation <laughs> so i've saved seven pound a month come on kids we're going to disneyland <laughs> it, was, it was it was just seven quid a month so yeah it was yeah. It, it, in those months as well it wasn't seven quid a month every month it was just in those in that yeah. in that in that peak season when i moved the um the max temperature down and then interestingly what I did was because I had a manifold I had a thermostat in every single room of the house mm -hmm. so what I did was I'm, I went from a six zone system to a two zone system so I just had a thermostat uh, sorry three zone system I had a thermostat downstairs for the whole ground floor because the whole ground floor was built in the 70s and then I had a thermostat for three of the bedrooms which was on the landing and then I had a thermostat for the master bedroom and the master bedroom was built in 2018 so the, the insulation levels of the master bedroom is much higher than the rest of the house. So that turns off sooner because when I had it as a two zone system, the master bedroom got too hot because the, the, the thermoskirt just ran and ran and ran in there until the, 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 you know, my son's front bedroom, which is north facing coldest corner of the house. Once the hall, once the landing was warm, then the master bed would turn off. So I had an extra thermostat. In there. The beauty of being a nerd about it is that you can do all of these things at home and like your, your wife just thinks, oh, whatever, he's, Mm. Let him just he's, he's, he's having fun, he's not at the pub, so let him, let him carry on. So, um, so yeah, I, I did, I did, I did all that. And when I changed it to a lower zone system, I then saw a significant increase again. So, I, I reckon overall, I mean, in terms of cash in the bank, no difference because the cost of gas went up, but in terms of, um, in terms of kilowatt hours used, yeah, I, I would say probably between 10 and 15 percent improvement nice. just from. The biggest saving is on those shoulder months. So it's like spring where you might have a, the odd cold day, but then the next day is warm. And um, in autumn, you know, you, you might have a really nice sunny day, which is not actually that cold. I mean, like yesterday was, was like 12 degrees or whatever, and today it's 7 where I am. So it's, it yeah. responds better in those shoulder months yeah. than in the middle of the winter. Yeah, absolutely. Which is what you, you what you'd expect, right? Because in the middle of the winter, your system is designed like your system design temperature. Um, if that's what you kind of set to, is designed for the middle of the winter, right? And so it is in those kind of you know, anything outside of that is when you're looking to get those gains because you you need to you know adjust that flow temperature because the temperature outside is much higher, right? Um, but yeah, makes sense, man. It sounds. Yeah, like you definitely have got um, a good, a, a really, really good grasp on on all of it, man. Like you're an engineer, right? As well, like you 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 install. Engineers probably overstating it. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I install, but be, being an engineer, uh, there's some people in in this business who are trained engineers, and they would go mad if I called myself an engineer. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose as far as the as far as thermoskirt goes, you know, I'm 32 now, and mm. I've lived and breathed this product since i was about 15 so yep. 
so yeah, I just, I just, I just know it like secondhand smoke, basically. I've just been around it, yeah, my, my, for my whole life. So I, I only know it um, through that. And then, and then one of the one of the really interesting challenges is that we're solving now, because as most people, hopefully, who are watching this can tell, you know, I wouldn't be. A lot of our marketing is like saying no to radiators and stuff, which I know is is often brought a smile to your face. Um, <laughs> I, I like the marketing, man. That's what actually kind of um, drew me to you guys in the first place. Apart from the fact that your dad was on Dragon's Den, and I am like actually a yeah. big. I, I don't know if you guys like Dragon's Den or not, because obviously they didn't give you the investment or whatnot. But I've always been a big Dragon's Den fan. Like I'm just a, a business guy. I like all kinds of business, right? Um, and yeah. I just love, I really like your business, man. I just like what you guys do, and I think your marketing's funny. Like I like it. It's cool. <laughs> Yeah, I like that. I like that. Well, d d despite our marketing, we aren't actually like radiator enemies. Like we under we yeah. understand that there's there's space in the market for everything, and yeah. and sometimes people, particular particularly on Facebook and TikTok. I mean, Instagram's actually quite a nice place, and LinkedIn's like a nice a nice friendly place. But but Facebook is like Facebook's like being like out in the streets, and then like TikTok is like being in a nightclub at two o'clock in the morning. You know what I mean? Like it just gets nasty, and yeah. um, and people genuinely think that like we're, we're basically saying thermoskirt is the only option, and everything else is a load of rubbish. And that's just not the case whatsoever. Like the the market is huge, and obviously, bog standard white panel radiators. Personally, I don't I don't like them unless you need to do, to do a job. But they're always going to exist. They're always going to be the cheapest way to heat your house from a capital expenditure point of view. You know, they they serve a, a purpose in the market. And then you have this ginormous designer radiator market where, you know, like like fashion, the world is your oyster. You can pay you can pay a hundred quid for a designer radiator, or you can pay ten grand for a designer radiator if you want. But like there's a, there's just this massive massive spectrum. And we're we're somewhere in that designer radiator um, spectrum, I guess. But what we we sort of market ourselves as like a designer radiator that suits all tastes. Like you know, we're not we're not like a, an orange, like you know that orange hexagonal radiator, whatever. Like somebody buys that because they like that look, but the next person goes, "Oh my god, what what on earth?" Whereas yeah. for, for us, that's that's kind of our pitch. So we're effectively like a designer radiator that's that feels like underfloor heating. And I think I think for us with with the heating engineers, that's been the challenge to overcome. Which is like, look, we know you love radiators. Don't worry, we're not here to take your toys off you. You know, if you want to keep your toys, you can have your toys. We're just saying there's like another game you can play over here if you want to, you know, yeah. or if your customers want to. Like it's there. There's an option. And now, and we're seeing the heat pump guys go first because the heat pump guys are the ones going into people's homes and saying. Okay, you need a K3 in here. And particularly in kitchen dining rooms, now that you've got these big open plan living spaces, if it's a, if it's an older property with very poor levels of insulation, underfloor heating can't hit it on its own. The thermoskirt can't hit it on its own if if you're designing to really low temperatures. So I mean some some of the engineers that we work with design to like 35 flow temperature and and they refuse to go higher because they're obsessed with COP. Whatever. They they want to play they want to play the COP game on heat pumps then fine whatever enjoy but that means that that the emitter challenge is massive the lower you go on the the lower you go on the flow temperature the bigger the challenge with your emitters it becomes and if they were going to heat it with radiators they would have like a k3 over here and a k3 over there and then another one and it would just look ridiculous yeah so what we're finding is is that a lot of those customers who don't want a bog standard white panel rad on the wall then get trapped like they're generally the customers who've got the money for a heat pump so mm -hmm. there's like this contradiction here that customers with money for a heat pump are also the customers who don't like the look of bog standard panel radiators. They want something a, a bit nicer. And mm -hmm. um, so they tend to go for underfloor or thermoskirt or designer ads. And at 35 degrees, there's very few designer radiators out there that, that can provide the heat output necessary. So those super flow, low flow temp guys, what they're doing is they're kind of hitting most of the heat outputs with the thermoskirt and then using a designer radiator to supplement it. Yeah. which the customer could turn on and off. They could, they could turn it off in the spring if they wanted to, just have it on in the winter. And I guess that's where there is a bit of synergy between what we do and what you do and other distributors as, as well, um, is the fact that what we, what, we, what we do, you as Rob and me as Ethan, is we just want what's best for the customer, right? Yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's exactly what you just said there. Like, 
like the marketing is marketing right and having a bit of fun with it i think is i think is cool do you know what i mean i think it's funny i think it's cool um but like in reality like you say like you've got to find the best solution for a customer like and every customer is different and they're going to have different wants and different needs potentially um so ensuring yeah. that you do that um it, it's paramount right um like you're like and for us like as soon as i saw your product i was like okay that's great for low, like especially in this low temperature um in this drive towards lower temperature systems um like for where our products in certain circumstances aren't going to be um aren't going to be enough like you can't unless you install you know two three four which at that point sometime you know it's going to get ridiculous right um, but yeah, pretty expensive having, having a nice um, you know, vertical design a radiator with with thermoskirt um, is an it's like an ideal solution, right? Um, to be able to kind of to, to to like say like solve the customer's problem, which yeah, that's what we're here for. It's about solving the problem for the customer. It's not about like some kind of ideology of like what you know <laughs> it, it has to be this or it has to be this. I mean the panel. Yeah, yeah. I mean you guys. I, I know you guys like um, like like you said like you. you not a fan of just bog standard panel rads but at the same time they do have a place in the market we have actually just taken oh, to pull away from that part of the market now we have sold panel rads right. up now but um as we continue to grow and as we continue to grow what we're doing with with designer rads and with with column rads and we want to introduce a lot more different designs and, and options to the market um you know we have limitations like any business like space is a real limitation for us and so um yeah. you know, taking that decision to completely pull back from that part of the market and just really again focus in on um like what we're best at which is you know column rads and designer rads um, like mass market appeal column rads and designer rads as opposed to the kind of um you know hexagon beehive um crazy yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> um, which is out there like you say you know, not not ten thousand pound designer radiators <laughs> Um, no, no, not saying that. Well, the, I guess I guess the sweet spot, like for anything, I guess the, the sweet spot for a designer radiator is somewhere in the region of like two hundred to five hundred quid. That's mm -hmm. going to be that's going to be where the mass bulk is because there's only so far someone's willing to go to spend money on, a, you know, a radiator. At the end of the day, it's not it's mm -hmm. not it's not a status symbol like a Rolex or a or a or a Porsche, is it? Nobody walks in and goes, oh wow, they Italian designer radiators. They just go, oh, okay, you you know, not got white panel lads. So yeah. with the sweet spot, yeah. we find that the same with the thermoskirt. There's, there's some properties we look at and we go, this is going to be crazy expensive. You know, you, 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 your room is like a mental shape. You've got curves, you've got corners everywhere. You know, the, the actual amount of performance you're going to get for the, for the cost is, it's not, it's whatever, you know. And then you find some people go, yeah, fine, whatever. But it's not, value is not related to price often. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, we it's it it's a 17th century manor house that's listed we can't lift the floors up to put underfloor heating in you know the house never would have had radiators in the first place and we're trying to keep it kind of architecturally mm. sympathetic yeah. um, and we've just spent like 30 grand on onyx worktops mm -hmm. so you know all of a sudden when it is like it is like 10 10 or 20 grand's worth of thermoskirt it's not that big a deal to to those people but for yeah. us where, where we're trying to get where we're trying to get to i mean Price wise, we're always really candid about price. So, you know, a, 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 for a typical room, thermoskirt is going to be somewhere in the region of 400 to 1,000 pounds. So, you know, it's, it's very rarely going to be less than 400 quid. If, if, you do a, if you do a small bedroom with thermoskirt on three sides, that'll probably be about 400. And then if you do like a bigger, you know, a square lounge, like the room I'm sat in now is like a four meter by four meter sort of meeting room that will be about a grand. And then if you go to bigger rooms, like open plan designer kitchens or whatever, that might be like a grand to two grand. So typically for a house, if you do thermoskirt everywhere, um, you know, you're probably looking in the region of like four to seven K for the kit. Mm. Um, but then that being said, most of our customers, domestic customers, they do thermoskirt in like one or two rooms and then do radiators everywhere else. 
Mm. Because they go, we really need the space in the kitchen diner or we really need the space in the master bed. But the two mm. back bedrooms, they'll just have standard rads or we'll just leave the ones that are in there. Mm. Um, so for us, you know, it's just pays your money, take your choice. There's something for all for all budgets, yeah. but Thermoscope is never going to be as cheap as a panel rad and we'd never try to be. It's like it's totally commod- commoditized product. There's no profit in it. You know, profit's what pays people's salary at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not interested in like chasing my tail trying to compete with with radiators. You know, yeah, not with no, especially yeah, especially not panel beds. I mean, it's a, it is an amazing alternative to underfloor heating as well, um, because like you say, like yeah. so, you know, un, and I think underfloor is a good solution. I mean, we don't Same. sell it, like we don't sell underfloor heating. My brother's got underfloor. He, he did an, a quite a big extension on his house, and he put he put underfloor um, in the extension. Um, like you know you kind of see people <laughs> online and in groups and, and you know in these types of places especially in like um uh, we were doing some stuff with um whatever uh, bees before desnes you know we we're doing some like uh oh, yeah. conversation stuff with them like answering questions and all of that kind of stuff and you get people in those that were just like what's the point in even talking about radiators underfloor heating is the future and it's just like yeah, somewhat. Like the underfloor heating is great, but there is also a market for radiators too. So that's what we're talking about. Like, like, it's not like a one like one size fits all solution or one kind of silver bullet solution for all scenarios, is it? And like your and your product, you know, um, you know, it's 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 something different um, that has been that you, that you guys have brought brought to the market and. Like that's a good thing, right? That should be seen as a good thing, whether you sell radiators or not. Like that should be seen as a good thing. Yeah, I, I, it, it it's starting to be. It's been like a real challenge. Um, you know, I think I think when you're bringing in a product that essentially people see see you as a threat. So if they see you as a threat, they 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 then just immediately either like discount the idea or they 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 kind of try to sort of dispel it or like create myths about it. And we hear crazy crazy stories like. This will never produce enough heat. You know, but it either does or it doesn't. Like it's, your opinion has nothing to do whether it creates enough heat or not. It depends on the circumstance, what the outside temperature is, what the flow temperature is. Like, and, I mean, I've told our t- our team sometimes. Like they look they look through the Instagram comments and they're just like, oh. you know, because they, they get so riled up because they because yeah. they know that it works and they've done it thousands of times for thousands of customers. So when they see people go, I'll stick with my radiators, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no one's making you have it. Like, I'm not going to come around your house and rip your radiators off the wall. Like, you don't have to. If you want to keep them, like, honestly, that's absolutely fine. You, you don't see, like, you don't see, um, what's it? What's an example? You don't see, like, Balenciaga say, you have to wear these ridiculous black trainers. <laughs> no. like, if, if you want to wear Converse, no one's going to take your Converse off you. You know what I mean? It's just another option. So yeah, for us, option. it's like, we... we we kind of say to ourselves, look, we, we, what we want to be is like the BMW of, of, of heating. Wow. So, you know, we're not, the, we're not the cheapest. If you want the cheapest, you know, don't buy, don't buy a BM. Okay. Mm. We're also not the most expensive. Mm. Okay. We're, we're, we're reliable. Um, mm. We're honest. We're straightforward. Like you get what you pay for and, mm. and that's it. So I'm just trying to like align ourselves with, with BMW and you, you, you just be confident in, you, in yourself. Like we're confident in the product. I've yeah. I've personally installed hundreds of systems. Everybody who works for us gets thermoskirt in the house for free. Like we just we just fitted like six grams worth of thermoskirt in Tom's house, and um, and you know Tom's got a crazy life. He's renovating a house. He's got four kids. Like he's under the cosh, and we're like we're, we'll put thermoskirt right the way through your house. And the reason for that is because then the people who work for us live with it. Mm. Their, their confidence in the product is just extreme because they go, well, we just we just went through last winter with it and it's brilliant. So when anybody mm. then kind of like dismisses it, they're just they're speaking from a first hand account. You know, my house is 1960s and it works just fine. So there's no reason why it won't work for you. And no, um, no. so to, to sort of wrap wrap up, Rob, um, what's the next step then in this in this battle to get radiator outputs? Mm. accurate and and how can we help when when it's going out do you reckon this this will be going out probably uh first week in november second week in november all right a week or two okay a week or two yeah so so tuesday next week so tuesday the first first of november i think it's not the first tuesday the fifth yeah tuesday next week 
Um, yes, we've, yeah. got, we've got a meeting with, so I'm going to tell, I'll tell you this now because this would go out after that meeting, but with Mark, um, the Manufacturers Association, we have, a, um, there's a meeting, it's a monthly meeting that they do, but the OPSS are joining that meeting. Um, so that that's the next step really is to really get their feedback and see what see what they have to say um so the kind of the last bit of sort of progress that we had was that we sent them we sent the OPSS um, which is the office for product safety and standards so so they they have responsibility for upholding the regulations um we sent them all of the test reports from the from the video that we made they they got in contact and they asked for us to send them test report and to send them like uh, like all of our proof of purchases and basically everything that we documented throughout that documentary. Um, so we sent that to them um, and we heard just like, I mean, we heard a couple of months ago that they were investigating and that they were going to take things forward. Um, and then I heard last week that they're going to be joining this meeting um, to give us a, an update on what their findings are and, and what they believe the next step should be um so that's going to be really interesting um that's a it's a it's quite a big step forwards and yeah can be cool exciting all right well just want to say thanks very much thanks for, for for joining me and um if anybody who's watching who is a domestic customer and you want a designer radiator or a towel rail to go with your thermoskirt system please go to uk radiators yeah definitely uk radiators.com Nice it comes up with our ad and then you have to click the ad and we have to pay for it. So you can read it and start cut. It costs you 50p then, doesn't it? Yeah. I just want to say before I let it go, like, I do really love your business, man. I really love what you guys are doing. Obviously made in the UK, right? It is. Yeah, yeah. made in the UK, which it's is made amazing. Made in Corby, yeah. In fact, I'll show you, I'll show you this. This is the this is uh this is what we make it out of. So this is the aluminium billet. Yeah. So the, the the reason I have this in this room is because the thermos skirt that's in this room is about 13 meters of skirting in here is made from this amount of aluminium. So that yeah. that will this will heat a room this this block here, yeah. and this block is 75% recycled. So it actually comes from a recycling centre in North Wales and then gets right. extruded in um, in Corby. Yeah, I see. I'm, I'm sure I've seen a reel like where you've got, where you're doing something with one of those blocks. I can't remember exactly what it was. I'll have to go back and have another look. But that's another thing, like the main one, this one yeah. I think it was 75% re recycled uh, material. So that's amazing. But like family business, right? It, patents on your product, you know, you've created something, you've brought it to market and then you absolutely smash it with the social media. Like, I just like seeing you guys do well, man. Cause I just, I just like the business. I just wanted to say that. Well, that, that, that love's too directional, mate. All right, take it easy.